the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. Practical psychology for today. Featuring the works of Idris Shah, narrated by David Alt. Welcome to the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. In this edition of the podcast, we will hear selections from Seeker After Truth by Idris Shah. This audio is made available by the Idris Shah Foundation. How the World Aids the Sufi One of the masters of the path was sitting in his assembly one day when a student stepped forward and asked, What analogy can there be of the position which the teacher occupies in this world? What, I mean, is his relationship with worldly events, and is he dependent upon them? The teacher answered, The world is there, and so is the teacher. He is within it and works outside it. It will reject him and also has to help him because of his unusual quality. This is recorded in the tale of the young man whose secret was not to be told. It is as follows. There was once a youth who wanted to serve humanity. Unlike most such people, he did not desire to do this for purposes of vanity, which meant that his service might be accepted and that he might, indeed, achieve the role which is so badly needed by humankind. One night he had a dream, and in the dream he was warned that if he set off to try to help people, he would only harm them in the end, for they would oppose him and in so doing would increase their own cruelty. He was told in the dream that he should conceal from everyone until a certain time that he wanted to be useful. In the meantime, he was, however, allowed to say that he had a secret which was not to be told. The youth told his parents first about the secret. They eventually became so annoyed with him that they lost interest in him, and they made little resistance when he decided to leave the house to seek his fortune. He obtained employment with a stallholder in the local town for a time, until one day his master heard him say that he had a secret which nobody was to know. Tell me, he said, or I shall beat you. The youth refused, and his master set about him with a stick until a passing merchant rescued him and took him into his employ. They travelled much, and eventually arrived at the capital city of the country. One day, the youth mentioned that he had a secret that nobody should know until a certain time. Again, the merchant tried to find out what it was, and when his employee would not tell him, he threw him into the street as a disloyal and probably deranged villain. At that exact moment, the prime minister of the country was passing. His king was dying, and, in accordance with the custom of that country, the minister had to go in disguise into the streets and seek a young man about whom some peculiarity had been divined by the wise men of the court. He would be the next king. As he stood beside the merchant's house, he saw the youth thrown into the street, and heard him say, I will not tell my secret until due time. And this was exactly the phrase which the royal seers had instructed the prime minister to seek. He took the young man to the king's deathbed, and the king asked him whether he would accept the crown. I will, your majesty, said the youth, for the secret is this, that I will not be able to help humanity adequately until I become materially powerful as king of the country. The Loaf of Bread A Sufi of great wisdom was asked for a parable of the work of the teachers and the nature of the disciples, and he at once answered, There was in former times a man who wanted to protect a treasure from a robber so that he could share it with the deserving of this world. The robber was strong and violent, 
and a generous man had nothing to help him but, of all things, a talking loaf. The robber arrived at the door of the house and threw it open. Just inside, on a small table, sat the talking loaf. The loaf said, Honoured friend, what is your mission, what your intention, what your purpose? Now the robber, in spite of being uncouth and greedy, was, like most of us, also intensely curious by nature. He was, moreover, quite taken aback by the sight of a loaf which could talk. He said to it, How do you come to be able to talk, and what can you tell me? The loaf replied, I can talk because I am in this house, which is a magical one. If you come in, you too will develop magical powers. That is exactly what I want, said the robber. Before you enter, continued the loaf, you should note that you will have to go through what I have gone through, which is no small matter. And what have you gone through, you, a loaf, that I, an experienced robber, cannot? I do not say you cannot, said the loaf, but I will allude to my experiences, so that you may have choice. Tell me then, demanded the robber. First of all, said the loaf, I was a plant and grew in a field. Then a part of me became dry, like death, and fell off. It was buried in the cold ground, where it lay until it split open. Then it was soaked in water until it was swollen and shoots came out of it. It grew into another plant, and found itself seized and beaten until its husk was separated from its inward part. The inner kernel was beaten into powder, which was mixed with other powder and put away. Then it was taken out, pounded with water and other things until it became sticky, and placed in a terrible heat until it became brown, and lo, it was me. When the loaf looked up after this recital, it saw that the robber had fled, and he could be heard in the distance sobbing with fear. The Sufi continued, The robber's greed to rob the house is the desire of the disciple before he knows that the treasure is there to be served, not to be stolen. The bread is the process of discovering this. But most disciples are not true seekers, for they flee from truth by imagining other things about the teaching. Intelligence and Obedience There was once a Sufi teacher who was approached by two men who begged him to allow them to become his disciples. He agreed on the understanding that they were on three months' probation. For nearly ninety days the master gave them no tasks, told them no stories, invited them to no meetings. Then, when their time was nearly up, he called the two into the courtyard of his house and said, I want each one of you to go outside, where there are camels. Each of you is to take the leading rein of one camel, and to bring it to me, climbing the wall and making the camel climb the wall. The first disciple said, Master, it is written that man must exercise his intelligence. My intelligence tells me that what you ask is impossible, and my good sense tells me that you have only asked this in order to test whether I am intelligent or not, and whether I use my common sense or not. Then, said the master, you will not attempt to bring the camel over the wall? I shall not, said the disciple. I ask forgiveness for appearing to disobey. Then the master turned to the second disciple and said, What is your answer to my request? Without a word, the second disciple started to go out of the courtyard through the gate. The master followed, motioning to the first disciple to accompany him. When they were all outside the high wall where the camels stood, the second disciple took the leading rein of one of the beasts and walked it to the outside wall. He then made an attempt to climb the wall, 
with the camel's rein still in his hand, making encouraging noises to it. When it was obvious that he could not succeed, the master said, Return this camel to its place and follow me within. A few minutes later, when the three men were again standing within the courtyard, the master said, Everyone knows, since the earliest days of humanity, that the path demands various capacities. These include the use of intelligence and the application of common sense, and also obedience. Obedience is as important as intelligence and common sense. Everyone who has ever taught will know that almost everyone will try to use intelligence and common sense in preference to obedience, thus putting these three qualities out of balance. The vast majority of humanity considers that to obey is less important than to think of a way out of a situation. But it is in fact known that none of these things is more important than another, except in the performance. Now we can find men of intelligence anywhere, but where can we find people of obedience? The first disciple is dismissed because he placed too much importance upon intellect. The second is retained because he did not jump to the obvious conclusion which men tell each other is the best thing to do, and yet which, as often as not, deprives them of full capacity. He turned to the second disciple and asked him why he had tried to do the impossible. The disciple said, I knew that you knew it was impossible, so that there was no harm in obedience to see where it led. I knew that the easy way out was to say, It is impossible, I shall not attempt it because of common sense, and that only a superficial person would think in that way. Everyone has as much common sense as would be needed to refuse to obey. Therefore I knew that you were testing my obedience and refusal to choose easy options. How to make them hear A dervish, instructing a disciple, said, There is only one way to make people hear you. You must know what you are saying and you must have the necessary conduct for people to hear you. The disciple, irritated by the long time which his ancient mentor was taking to give out his wisdom, felt that he had heard enough and went on his way. For some years he studied the art of knowing what he was saying and cultivated the conduct of a good man. People began to respect him, and few left his presence without remarking what a pure soul he was. One day, a young man arrived at the town where he was to make a speech. The youth kept shouting scandal, and everyone listened to him. Hardly anyone went to the lecture by the dervish's pupil. So he went back to his old master, now over a hundred years old, and asked him to explain. Ah, said the ancient, you are the man who did not wait to hear the end of the teaching. You see, you have to be the kind of saint that people want at the time. If they want a real man, they will not go for teaching to a man simply because he looks like a saint. The qualifications for a teacher are not that he has a certain look, but that he has a certain effect. Hypocrisy Yahya, son of Iskandar, relates, I sat many evenings at the house of Sufi Anwar Ali Jan. People brought him gifts, which he had converted into food and caused to be served each evening before the time of meditation. He would not allow anyone to be near him and sat in the corner with his hand moving from his bowl to his mouth. Many of those who visited him said, This man is haughty and lacks humility, for he draws himself away from his guests. Each evening I moved my place imperceptibly closer to him, until I could see that, although he went through the motions of eating, there was no food in his bowl. At last I could not restrain my curiosity, and I said to him, 
What is the cause of your strange behavior? Why do you pretend to eat? And why do you allow people to claim that you are haughty when you are in fact modest and abstemious and do not want to upset or shame them, O most excellent of men? He answered, It is better that they should think that I am lacking in modesty through observation of externals than that they should think that I am virtuous through the mere observation of externals. There can be no greater sin than attributing merit through appearances. To do so insults the presence of the interior and true virtue by imagining that it does not exist to be perceived. Men of externals will judge by externals, but at least they are not polluting internal things. Whispering There was once a Sufi teacher who was approached by one of his disciples. Master, he said, I am constantly bullied by the other members of the community. They make my life miserable. Unless it is your desire that I should endure this, I would like them to stop it. Nothing easier, said the Sufi. All you have to do is to come up to me when we are sitting in contemplation and whisper into my ear. Then I shall whisper into yours. No sooner had this happened the first time than the oppressed disciple became the most favoured among the community. After all, was he not allowed to speak to the master in whispers? One day, however, one of the more forward of the disciples said, Master, may we not hear what you are saying to this fellow student of ours? After all, we are as docile and intent as he is. The master agreed, and the next time there was an assembly, he called the formerly oppressed pupil and said to him aloud, Can you yoke bulging eyes? Yes, said the man. Good. What do you earn? Ten. And what do you waste? Five. What happened to the thirty-two? Twenty-nine are at home. The other disciples goggled at this, and when they were alone together they disputed loud and long about the inward meaning of the mystical conversation. Finally, however, their opinions were so diverse that they decided to ask the meaning. The favoured disciples said, It is all quite simple. The master wanted to show you that you were easily impressed by trivialities, so he whispered to me. You yourselves decided that this was a mark of favour, and you made yourselves treat me well. But what about the cryptic conversation? It had nothing to do with you. I earn ten silver pieces. I waste five on my son's education. But the thirty-two must surely be people of importance or spiritual merit. The thirty-two are my teeth. I still have twenty-nine, so they may be said to be still at home in my mouth. Ah, said the disciples, he is trying to put us off, because the key is probably in the question which we have not asked. That will be the one with the real inner meaning. They asked the pupil, what did the teacher mean when he asked if you could yoke bulging eyes? Give me a gold piece and I will tell you, he said. As soon as he had got the money, he answered, That was a demonstration that you can yoke bulging eyes. The eyes are yours, bulging with greed. They are yoked by stimulating curiosity, because all trivial minds are manifested by inquisitiveness. What then should we learn? they cried in anguish. The teaching is, covetousness, whether in material or spiritual things, leads to pleasure in trivialities. This prevents you from gaining higher understanding and blocks your progress. It can only be dissolved by a demonstration of how trivial your thoughts really are. Self-obsessed A man went to the dwelling place of a dervish and said to him, I want to discuss my problem with you. 
And I, said the dervish, do not want to discuss it. The man was annoyed. How can you decide that when you do not know my problem? The dervish smiled. Why should you bring a problem to me if I do not know about it and do not have perceptions greater than others? Now the visitor was both confused and anxious. Tell me what my problem is then and that will convince me, he said. O oh, human being, said the dervish, you are almost completely awry. If I show you that I know what is in your mind, I shall divert your attention to the miraculous and fail in my duty of service as against theatrical performance. Well then, said the man, give me the solution to the problem alone, thus fulfilling the requirement of service. That I have already done, said the dervish. But I cannot understand you at all, said the visitor. I am not aware that you have given me any solution. Then go on your way and seek the answer elsewhere. For months after that, this man travelled, and he talked to many people, describing his encounter with the dervish. One day it dawned on him that his problem had been self-centeredness, and that the dervish had been pointing this out. This was his real problem, not the one which he had imagined was his. Not long afterwards, in a city distant from the first encounter, he saw the dervish again. He said, I have now realized the wisdom of your speech, and I seek to recompense you for your service to me. You have already done so, said the dervish, for in telling everyone of our conversation, you have been helping to teach, though not desirous of doing so, with yourself as the living illustration of ignorance and perplexity, like a man with an arrow stuck in his head, which all but he can see and with a headache which he alone attributes to the difficulties attending deep thought. This was your service, but though in appearance and conviction you were trying to serve yourself, you were in reality serving wisdom, as I have indicated. In consequence, wisdom has partly manifested to enable you to see yourself a little better. You have, however, served not only wisdom, but also self-obsession, not yourself. In fact, anyone can make you serve anyone or anything by the simple method of convincing you that you are serving yourself if you take a course of action which is in fact designed to serve some other end. Who is the gainer from such a transaction? This podcast is copyright 2018, the Idris Shah Foundation.